title needs to be the same, I think. Uh, so um, it's all yours. Yes, the title looks a little bit the same, but in fact I'm um, talking about something that does not really exist in Japan. So <laughs> we have in Japan nearly no academic discourse about uh, gentrification. And actually there is one guy who is doing some research about gentrification in Japan, but this is a, really a minority program more or less. And we do not find um, big cit citizen movements who protest against um, urban change and urban renewal. So, but when we look at the case of Osaka, um, my, my, my research uh, area is located in Osaka, in Nakasaki neighborhood. Um, we see a lot of different changes in the city who occurred in the last few years. One of these changes, for example, that the population of Osaka started to rise again after a long period of declining. And we have also major urban redevelopment pro, um, processes and programs inside of the city. For example, they built now in the area of Tennoji in the, in the south of Osaka, the highest building in Japan, and things like that are going on. And um, and therefore, I, I picked out, out one area that, is, um, that experienced a lot of change and applied a Western model of gentrification and look um, how, what is matching and what is not matching and what is different in the case of, of Japan. So this is the structure of my presentation. First, I, um, yeah, and uh, commercial gentrification. Why commercial gentrification? I, I picked um, commercial gentrification because um, um, the commercial landscape of the, this area changed very much, and I think this is a, one of the key to understand the change. And urban regeneration in this case um, means just something else. It's not a, a concept I apply here. Um, first, I will talk a bit, little bit about the concept of um, commercial, uh, uh, region, uh, uh, re commercial gentrification. What does this mean and what are, what are the um, uh, particular characteristics of it? Then I will speak about the historical background of the Nagasaki neighborhood. And then I will speak about the changes that occurred in this area. And in the end, I will give a short summary and some suggestions, because um, I'm still at the beginning of my research, and I have uh, read a lot of literature about the area and have done some preliminary um, interviews, but I have not done systematic um, research in, in the moment. And so I, I speak here of suggestions, of kind of a working hypothesis and not of real results. It's not uh, valid in the moment. So first about uh, the commercial landscape as an arena of inequality. Um, from the beginning on, gentrification research focused largely on the residential aspects of neighborhood change. But in recent years, the sum number of research focusing on the retail sector has increased. Uh, one of the researchers who pushed this kind of research forward is uh, Sharon Sukin. And she um, published a paper called New Retail Capital on Neighborhood Change Politics and Gentrification New York City that was very influential in this um, kind of research. Um, where, is, uh, uh, where is this uh, change? Uh, the, um, this commercial gentrification occurring, it's occurring at the beginning of a, a gentrification process. So um, to put it in Neil Smith's terms, um, at the gentrification frontier, and this means as well temporal as also spatial. Um, there are two different patterns of commercial gentrification. The first is, the first pioneers are individually owned boutiques often started by new local residents. When population density is greater and available stores are larger, more boutiques arrive and chain stores open, bidding up rents above the level many of the pioneers can afford. So here the actor uh, uh, 
small uh, entrepreneurs who come into a neighborhood to so open their, their shops. The second is gentrification of traditional retail markets follows a cycle of disinvestment by local authorities and displacement of long-standing market stallholders and customers. This is followed by plans to, re to reunite and regenerate through the insertion into the market of stalls selling upmarket products, relocation to shopping centers, or the complete boutiqueing. Here, um, the state uh, um, is the actor who is triggering this gentrification process. This is the difference. What, uh, how, is, how is this uh, gentrification of the retail market or of the commercial landscape um, connected with the broader gentrification process? First, um, the retail stores are part of a different culture than existed in the area before. Um, this means they have different symbols. Um, here are restaurant tables on sidewalks, cutting edge music piped into the streets, eye-catching awnings, and business signs prominently displayed products etc. So it's very visible and you can hear it, that it's a different culture. <coughs> These symbols create symbolic boundaries that exclude long-time residents since they are not part of the subculture. Um, and um, Davison and Leeds argued the problem here is one of displacements, whereby displacement, whereby people feel the loss of a sense of identity with the place. This leads to a gradual movement away rather than a once and for all decision to go and never return. Um, so in the end, this triggers also this place, displacement. And the, the final step would be the symbolic ownership by creating an area brand. F furthermore, more this new uh, stores do not uh, sell products the uh, long-term residents in the area need. Um, basically, poor neighborhoods suffer most times from a lack of retail including those that supply basic goods and services like banks, drug stores, or grocery stores. In gentrifying neighborhoods, an increase in retail can be found. The new business, art galleries, yoga studios, clothing, boutiques, restaurants, etc., appeal to the discretionary tastes and incomes of newcomers and non-local customers. Finally, um, also displacement occurs of the uh, established businesses in this era, area. This means uh, the rents are going up and uh, some stores have to close or other um, people decide to close the, the, the who, who own their own shop decide to close it and um, retire and sell the property. Um, finally, also new retail store, stores mark an area as safe for investment that will upgrade services and raise rents. Okay, I will now, my research question is as follows. The, are the new retail stores in the Nakasaki neighborhood creating a commercial landscape that excludes long-term residents or is a more inclusive urban regeneration going on? And I will test this, uh, hypo I will test this question on looking on these four, um, four characteristics of retail um, gentrification, of commercial gentrification, how it is, um, uh, how it is, connected to a long, uh, wider gentrification process. So now I will speak about the historical background of the Nakasaki neighborhood. Um, this is a map of Osaka city. Here you can see the Nakasaki neighborhood. It's located, located close to the, uh, the, the northern center of the city, Osaka, around Osaka station. It's a big commercial cent uh, center where a lot of um, uh, urban renewal projects uh, are going on in the moment. And this is the Kita Ward. It is located in the center of the Kita Ward. And here is uh, the southern center of the city. It's also a commercial center. And here is um, um, uh, Nishinari Ward, the area um, uh, Gerhard talked yesterday about. And here is Tenoji, the area where the largest building in Japan is now built, built in the moment. Um, the Nakasaki neighborhood was in, um, became in April 1897 a part of Osaka city. Um, but uh, the first 
and, and from this moment on, it started to be um, um, uh, developed. And but the first uh, town plane came into effect in 1918. This means that the roads are very narrow and the passes are very small in this area. Um, during the industrialization, industrialization, a lot of factories were built in its vicinity and it became home of factory workers. And also from 1911 on, Korea became a Japanese colony. And a lot of uh, workers came from Korea to Osaka. Osaka was one of the major commercial centers in uh, com um, industrial centers in Asia at that time, and about 10% of its population were Korean people, and many of them settled next to factories, and this was also in this area. Here in this area next to Ogawa, this river here, a lot of factories settled, uh, were placed, and also here. And then there is another thing about the area. Um, also, it became home to uh, the out to an outcast group. Um, also, Gerhard told us yesterday that there are Budakumin in Japan, people who are um, were discriminated because of the 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 jobs they did. They were most times working with leather or uh, meat. And. Um, yeah, it, um, and they, they were, they lived segregated from the city in, in the past, and one of these communities was moved to this area as well. But one crucial fact here is that when in 1969 a new anti-discrimination law was passed, the area in which the Purakumin lived in um, the Nagasaki neighborhood, was not targeted by um, the anti-discrimination law, and therefore the old buildings remained and no um, social housings were built in this area. Here we have a map of Osaka city, and it shows where terrace houses are located. Terrace houses are the, where the traditional um, housings in Osaka. And the purple part here in the center was formed during the Second World War. All traditional housings were destroyed here as well. Only uh, in, in the Kitawa, only in this area, in the area where the Nakasaki, where, where the Nakasaki labor food is located, uh, a <coughs> large stock of terrace houses remained. And also here in Nishinariwat as well. Here you can see as well that there are some old buildings. And the Nakasaki neighborhood was also not um, redeveloped during the bubble economy in the 1980s. Um, here is a report about the condition of the area of the Kitawat, who was published in 1986. Um, I will read this. This area is characterized by its many residential housings, its large population, and its high population density. There are many densely built wooden houses, things which are awfully old. The roads are in a bad condition, and because of their narrowness, this area is highly geopatrized by disasters. There are hardly no parks. The environment under the National Railways loop line is dirty. The Honshu public market was rebuilt and is today, because of its tidiness, a busy place. The Nagasaki shopping street is not well frequented. So we have here a lot of similarities with the area um, Gerhard um, told us yesterday about. So the roads are very narrow. It, it is very sensitive, it, it's problematic in the case of a disaster. And we, uh, um, and um, yeah, and also the shopping street is uh, not very well frequented. Um, in this report was also a survey about um, the shops, uh, dif different areas where shops existed in the Kita Ward and uh, number 19 is the, the uh, is a part of the Nakisaki neighborhood. And when we look here, here it was asked um, how is the condition of the shopping street and the majority here is the Nakasaki neighborhood uh, of the people who answered that the number of customers are decreasing. 
Here it was asked how is the situation of your business and the major majority as well here as, as answered that profit is decreasing. And then they were asked if they want to, if possible, um, uh, how, how they think about the location of the, the business. And many of them answered that they would want to move to another place, the black part is this. So to sum this up, um, we have here small parcels of land and narrow roads, a large stock of small wooden terrace houses remained. In Japanese, they're called Nagaya, and many of them are vacant. We have a declining commercial landscape. We have an aging population, and it can be, be assumed that the history of the area uh, is an obstacle for investments of real estate developers. So now let's look what happened um, in the recent years in this area. Um, especially these old wooden housings, these uh, terrace houses, where be became um, very popular places to open uh, small stores, shops or cafes or restaurants also. And um, they have some characteristics, these buildings. And um, the first characteristic is that, that they have a lower quality than in other places. So when we look at the past of the area, it was a, a, um, a minority group lived there and a lot of workers lived there, so it, they were not the best buildings. But the, the, the positive thing is that they were very cheap at this moment. So the people who are young and have no money can, um, can rent them and can open their, um, their shop. Um, today, about approximately 200 stores exist in this area. And they were basically converted into galleries, small shops, cafes, or bars. And this here is um, Nagaya in the Abinovad, and here Airfon in the Nagasaki neighborhood. You see that here, these wooden parts look very nice. They are missing here, and also the roof is different. And how, what are the characteristics of the people who convert these buildings? Most times um, the houses are converted by individuals, young people with limited financial resources. Most of them open a store for the first time and they usually renovate the building by their own. This means it's very cheap for them. And the renovation takes from one week to two to three months. Here is one example of a renovated buildings, building. It's Salon do Amanto. It's a 130 years old one um, terrace house. And it was <coughs> renovated without using any new materials. The um, shopkeeper is calling this art. This is a combination between earth and art. <laughs> and in the end, this kind of renovating building became very successful and he is running today um, um, with his friends about 11 stores in this neighborhood who were renovated in the same way. And the first floor, uh, the, the, the ground floor is a cafe and in the second floor seminars and things like that are um, hold. Here is one attempt to map the change that occurred in this area. Um, the first um, gallery opened in this area in 1997. Um, until 2001, about 10 buildings were renovated in 2005. And in 2002, for the first time, it, it, in the, media, the media reported about this area, and there was large media coverage. And after that, um, the number raised dramatically. But this uh, map is based on... on on maps published in magazines and therefore for not all um, n not all um, shops and retail stores are on this map. For, furthermore, a lot of the people in this area in, are in working in the creative industry. That therefore, they have a, also knowledge about uh, designing or film making, and some of them try to appeal to our, to new cu customers um, and here we have one film who came out in 2007 uh, it 
was shot in the Nakasaki area and um, it uh, was an art house film shown on different festivals, um, on film festivals in order to promote this area. And next to that, that we have a regional magazine also uh, published in the area. Uh, in addition, there are also a lot of events hold in the area, uh, some traditional events, see these three events here, they, they are organized by the local um, neighborhood organization and the orange events are organized by the new stores. And we see that also in recent years the local uh, community started to organize new events. What is happening here? Um, here, the next slide shows here a special issue of a local magazine on the Nakasaki neighborhood, published in 2006. And this one is um, um, published by the um, by Kita Ward, it's the the area in which um, the Nakasaki neighborhood is located, and. Um, it is part of an education program that should teach the residents uh, about the area they live in. And here it's, it's very interesting because when we consider what we hear about <coughs> Nishinari Wat, that there, there, there are small roads and uh, it's dangerous and it, it is considered as an inferior living <coughs> environment and here suddenly it becomes the place to go. It become, came, um, here, here is written a maze like Rachel Town. So it's, it's, this what, what is conceived as uh, inferior in Nishinari Ward is here the unique selling point somehow in the Nakasaki neighborhood. Um, I found also one small survey on long term residents, and most of them answered that they, that they never use the new retail stores or um, there are only certain people participated in the survey, so it's, it's very preliminary. But um, most of them answered that they never used these retail stores and there was nobody who goes there every week. For the more, more they considered these stores as kind of um, exclusive and alien in the area and they don't have the impression, most of them don't have the impression, um, that the area is now inter more interesting for shopping and walking around. So now let's take a look at the population development in the Nakasaki neighborhood. The black line is the, the population development of Osaka City, the orange one of the Nakasaki neighborhood. We see that from 1995, um, the population is uh, gradually increasing. And from 2000 on, it's, uh, we see a sharp increase from this period where the media coverage of the area started. What is behind this increase is um, the development of, of, of apartment buildings. So we see here uh, data from the national census on the Nakasaki neighborhood. And we see a decrease of terrace houses, of people who live in ter terrace houses. Of course, they are. Um, they were uh, the, uh, in, in these terrace houses, the, the cafes and the new retail stores, and um, um, the new residents basically live in apartment buildings who are higher than six um, f six stores. That's um, yes. Uh, here we we see the age cohorts, and um, especially especially after. 2000, we seen an increase of people in the 20s and 30s. While um, the pattern of 1995 and 2000 is very similar to the pattern of Osaka City. And this is a new development that young people move and live in this area. Um, how does the employment structure change in the area? On the left side we see the data of Osaka City, on the right side of the Nakasaki neighborhood. Um, the uh, basic difference is that many people in the Nakasaki neighborhood used to be employed in the service sector, 
compared to Osaka City as uh, as as compared to Osaka City. This is very has very much to do with the fact that it's uh, a central area and close to uh, different shopping area areas where these people work to work in. And in from 2000 to 2010, people in the administration and specialized occupation and technical occupations started to increase uh, much more than in Osaka City as a whole. So now I will um, uh, give a short summary on this. Um, we have seen that the new retail stores do not serve the needs for, of long-term residents and they tend to avoid them. The new retail stores in the neighborhood are culturally different and create symbolic boundaries through area branding they get symbolic ownership. Most of the new retail stores use vacant building and therefore displacements of established business is unlikely. This is very different from the normal gentrification narrative. After the influx of retail stores, investment in apartment buildings was made that attracted residents in specialized and technical occupations and in the administration associated with the new middle class. Um, and now I want to give some suggestions. Why is this so? We, we see there the, the, the are very, uh, there are many points uh, very um, similar to the gentrification narrative but um, there's no protest or something like that occurring. This has on the one side to do, I suggest, that um, there's a symbiotic relationship between the long-term residents and the shopkeepers. This means most of the long-term residents are shop, uh, homeowners and they profit as well from the fact that the area gets popular. And the, on the other side, the shopkeepers um, can have a possibility to realize their ideas because the uh, uh, cheap um, shops available, cheap, cheap um, um, buildings available. W what be is becoming more and more um, a threat to this si uh, situation is the building of the, the arrival of new apartment buildings um, and um, um, here is um, kind of a, um, a, yes, a, a, a local miss, maybe. So um, around the area of the Nakasaki neighborhood is um, a ring of uh, what she saw some. This, these are small stone stages, and it is believed that they protect the area. And um, the, it is also believed that because of their pre presence, the area was not bombed during the Second World War. And now, because um, new apartments are built in the area, this ring is disappearing, so these small stages are disappearing. And so it looks, um, f for, for the residents, this means that now, in this moment, the area is changing. And there's a, a third suggestion I want to make. Um, it's about the spatial structure of the area. Uh, like I told before, there are a lot of small houses who are, and narrow roads, and therefore it is uh, the, uh, the situation makes it very easy and, and fosters the communication between the neighbors, between the, the local long-term residents and the new retail stores. And therefore, there are, uh, are a lot of, uh, it is very easy to build up a relation to the people who work in this area and the people who live in this area that is not based on consuming in a shop. Okay. I think I should just say that I, I could be wrong about this because I was only the timekeeper for this session, but I think we should congratulate Johannes as being, I think, the only one of us that actually stayed under 30 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Therefore, we have time for questions. Okay. <laughs> I, I don't, I'm a newcomer to this uh, 
historical court are here of tangibilities of the view and view consider this as a kind of uh, classic gentrification, a kind of so-called new type of gentrification to come, especially for Japan as a, a kind of aging, aging country, but now seems undergoing some kind of reju uh, rejuvenation, mm -hmm. or at least a uh, kind of economic turbo, turbo driving now. Mm -hmm. and, uh, is it a way forward actually also for other aging countries in Asia, including Hong Kong, Taiwan, or etc.? Um, a kind of new form of gentrification. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure where, where, where I should apply this new. So, new in the sense that it just occurred in the in the in in a temporary sense, I would say in in the case of Japan, it is clearly um, new. I think um, there are s some er areas who experienced the same development about well, that started about 20 years ago. In this area, it was 16 years ago. But uh, I think this phenomenon occurs in Japan or phenomena. Uh, related to this one um, since about maybe 20 years ago. In this sense, it is new. I wanted it's like both presentations about Osaka paint a picture of uh, some uh, quite low density and like a lot of abandoned places. And mm -hmm. just, could you explain that a bit more? I don't understand that dynamic of why are these, why is there so many abandoned spaces? Or do you have an idea about that? Well, I think uh, this has m much to do with the past of the city. It was always a very industrial city with a lot of industry. And with the downturn of the industry, and also with people who want to move outside of the city, because in areas like this, they they are very densely populated and not, have not have no good quality of life. Like I showed before in the report of, from the 1980s, it was considered as a quality, as an area where they just don't want to live. So most people move to the suburbs, and. Um, and stayed there, and th therefore the the population in the inner city was decreasing all the time. So, are these uh, vacant uh, terrace houses owned by somebody? So, are the retailers renting it, or are they buying it, or just just occupying them? No, no, they they rent them, of course. They are owned. Um, I, I think in, in the end I wanted to make this point, but it wasn't really clear. They are owned basically by people who live in the same areas, but um, so so th th there is a, a kind of a personal relationship between the home, the the, the man who owns the building and the the the, the one who um, is renting it. As a supervisor advisor of his, <laughs> I also uh, want to know the suggestion of his uh, schemes. Since because is the new gentrifications or alternative gentrifications, or what kind of gentrification happened in Japan is very controversial, and we are now thinking about how to express our uh, experiences in the recent years. And this kind of uh, gentrification should be. Uh, three aspect from uh, in terms of three aspect we have to consider because uh, the reindeer's rights is very preserved so the, they are kind of the Hong Kong or so they are kind of harsh uh, uh, development is impossible <laughs> if we, we want to do that it takes 30 years or more than 40 years so it takes time so it's a and the another, uh, this shopkeeper is uh, anti this the mass consumption styles of the supermarket or something else. Because uh, 
not so wealthy, but not, not so abundant. But uh, some uh, educated and a little bit of money, they put fund, uh, invest fund for the money, very little small shops. Uh, that, that, that kind of small shop is now drastically declining but in the, the, uh, at the traditional types, but uh, this kind of new uh, younger generation will try to, to do this kind of uh, uh, shop management. In that sense, uh, and also uh, this kind of the wooden, uh, your question is how, why did it have such kind of many volume of the inner city area in Osaka is some one sense in the in the preserve uh, pre more preserved in the uh, rentier's rights and also uh, it's very difficulty to the because the plot is very small so if there the no chance to invest such a high rising building and under the control of rigid control of urban planning so uh, they hesitate or uh, to redevelop and uh, one by one they buy it so it takes on another four, five, six years. So there's some vacant uh, rooms, but next to them is still alive, uh, still live. So the negotiation time is very long, longer. So it's preserved, but not so good conditions. And they become vacant. So, so that, uh, this kind of the <laughs> factors, uh, uh, where we are uh, now are arose in the Japanese urban um, urban scenes, and he uh, don't <laughs> we want to suggest uh, 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 comments. Thank you. Listening to you and, and listening to Jones's um, talk, this strikes me as being the most classical kind of gentrification, <laughs> and this is what Ruth Glass was describing in 1964 when she coined the term. It's what Neil Smith was describing first in 1977 in his undergraduate thesis, or 75, whatever year that was, and then in his 79 article, where it was this very piecemeal sort of thing. Uh, in his case, so it was organized through state financing, and that was a crucial piece of it. But it was in part because of the way that these places could be redeveloped uh, compared to the large bulldozer reclamations that were going on elsewhere in the city. And so in some ways, it strikes me as, as in, you know, exactly the most classical kind of, of gentrification. Yeah, yes, yes, to a certain to a certain degree, I, I agree here. But what seems to play a crucial role is, of course, the redevelopment by bigger companies who build housing in this area. So it's it's not just the the old buildings; it's also the de development on the the uh, it's also new buildings who are built in this area. I think were very important for the development. Well, I think we've uh, maybe come to the end of our uh, time of sessions. We are now moving to your, you're in, you're in charge now.